now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 706, this very busy Monday morning with so much to talk about, so much to catch up on you and I, because it's been, well, it's been a heck of a span since Friday morning when we last spoke. Coming up in 30 minutes, we'll take up yesterday's miracle win. Hail Mary, walk-off touchdown by your commanders. Trevor Maddich will join us on that. 805 Hung Cow running for Senate in Virginia will make his final case to you, the people. And then at 835, Laura Trump the co-chair of the Republican National Committee. I'm Larry O'Connor. That's Julie Gunlock. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. What a wild and amazing weekend we had. And we're joined now by Joe DeGeneva, our legal analyst and former U.S. Attorney of the District of Columbia. Joe, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Eight days to Election Day. Good morning. Yeah, I can't wait. We've already voted down here in Florida. Victoria and I have voted for Donald and uh, looking forward to a good outcome. Well, let's talk about Virginia for a moment, because Glenn Youngkin is doing his legal and constitutional duty to the Commonwealth to follow the law, a law that was signed in by then Governor Tim Kaine, a Democrat, to eliminate non-citizens and ineligible voters from the voter rolls. As you know, the Justice Department sued the state of Virginia for that. And over the weekend, they lost an appeal that Virginia did on that. They claim uh, they they vow to take this to the Supreme Court. Take a listen to Governor Yunkin over the weekend talking about this. This is a stunning ruling by a federal judge who is ordering Virginia to reinstate individuals who have self-identified as non-citizens back on the voter rolls. And what's even more astounding is the, the vast majority of these folks had presented immigration documents confirming that they were non-citizens, and they re- we recently had that verified by federal authorities. So here we are with a judge saying, put people back on the voter rolls who you know are non-citizens. And this yeah. is under a law in Virginia that's been in effect since 2006. All right. So Joe DeGeneva, last night at 7.30, Jason Miara, the attorney general, said they will be filing an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court immediately. Can you help us, for those of us who... Are you know feel like we're in some sort of through the looking glass situation here? What is is there any rational legal jurisprudence to back up this decision to to force Virginia to go out of their way to put ineligible voters back on the voter rolls? Well, this type of cognitive dissonance uh, is traditional uh, in the law, and it's the victory of process over substance. So let's just set the table. We know as a fact that the people that the court has ordered back on the voter rolls are not citizens and therefore cannot vote. So that means that they're not voters. And therefore, since they're not citizens and they cannot vote, they shouldn't be covered by this statute because this statute deals with voters. And you can't be a voter unless you're a citizen. Now, my advice to the attorney general and the governor of Virginia is as follows. The Supreme Court is not going to take this case. The attorney general and the governor have to file this appeal with the Supreme Court for legal and political reasons. But the next step should be a news conference at which they announce that any non-citizen who attempts to vote, seeks a ballot, or in fact votes will be prosecuted and make it very clear and go out of their way with an abundance of uh, cacophony and noise to make it clear if any of those non-citizens vote or try to vote, they will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. They have the right and the duty to say that. In fact, I would say that their duty to say that supersedes their appeal to the Supreme Court, which they are most likely to lose. They're not going to, because the courts, Supreme Court's not going to take this case. They're not going to intervene in all of, because there are like 10 of these states where this is where the Justice Department has sued uh, to prevent exactly this type of activity. So the court's not going to get involved in this. Uh, Joe, this ruling came from U.S. Judge Patricia Giles. What do we know about her? Was she an Obama appointee? You know, is are we looking at a sort of Judge Chunkin, Chunkin uh, situation here of an activist judge sort of helping out the Democrats? Well, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that 
most of these judges now, these appointees, Democratic appointees, are predisposed to do anything that they can to interfere uh, with any Republican initiatives. Uh, and this goes, by the way, for the Fourth Circuit, which, which affirmed this ruling by Judge Giles, uh, who issued this injunction against the governor and the attorney general and the state. Uh, there's no doubt that these are all Democratic judges. Sad to say that they're predisposed mm. not to give an inch on any of these issues. It's very sad, but that's where we are in America right now. Uh, by the way, a Biden appointee, in case anyone's keeping score at home. Uh, Joe, since you're in the business of doling out free legal advice this morning, which, by the way, just so you know, <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen Joe at dinner. He picked up the check one time. He's not used to giving out free advice, okay? Let's just be clear on that. But since, um, We've got Laura Trump, the co-chair of the RNC, joining us at 830. And here we are poised eight days before Election Day. I know that you were involved with a lot of the discussions of potential legal arguments with regard to the 2020 election and some of the extraordinary decisions made at local jurisdictions over the qualification, validation, and the counting of ballots that many people believe should have never been counted as a legal ballot. Here we are eight mm-hmm. days out. What advice do you give the RNC and the Trump campaign and other states that are looking at more potential shenanigans like we saw in 2020? Well, um, Laura Trump and Michael Watley have prepared the Republican National Committee as best they could, given the amount of time they had, because they did not take control of the RNC two years ago, which is when Ronald McDaniel should have been replaced. But they've done a really heroic job of getting 230,000 observers uh, at the polling places all over the United States and lawyers to litigate the issues. And they have to be ready to litigate immediately. But remember, courts are going to be loath to interfere and intercede in these cases. It's just the nature of the beast, because they always say, what's the remedy? Do you want me to tell people that I can't count their vote? I'm not going to do that as a judge. So what they've done is they've got the observers there. They're going to identify problems if they're allowed to stand close enough to the counting and see the faces of the ballots to uh, alert people to problems. The, the problem we have now is there hasn't been enough time for the RNC to prepare. They've done the best they can. I think they get an A-plus for preparation, heroic preparation, and just just be ready to go and hope for the best. And they appear to be ready to go, and they're not just hoping. They're armed and, and ready to go. Uh, Joe, we only have a minute left here, but as we're, you know, we spoke earlier this morning about what uh, – we're concerned might be a rational exuberance from the Republican side. Yesterday's rally looked almost like a uh, a victory lap. Uh, uh, your advice here, uh, being around the political game for as many years as you've been around, it's not. We're not used to feeling a week out like we've we're actually gaining momentum and that it looks like a victory is at hand. Usually, Republicans are always playing from behind at this point. So, how, what should people be doing? What should they be focusing on at this point? Well, get out the vote, because remember, the red wave in 20 and 22 didn't happen. And this this has a, a, a just a, a strange, similar feeling, except for the fact that the polling does appear to be reflective of a trend. In other words, there appears to be a polling trend toward Trump. And if he has any coattails, that will help us take the Senate, which is essential for him. And we have to keep the House, because if you don't keep the House, Hakeem Jeffries will be the speaker, and they will spend oh. all of their time trying God. to impeach Donald Trump and various members of his administration. The problem is you got to take the House and the Senate. Um, I just just people should be careful. Yeah. Save their exuberance for yes. election night when the when most of the tallies will be in, and we'll have a pretty good idea. But we're told it may be two weeks in some states before the tallies are final. And by the way, how can that be? How is it now? Yeah. It takes two weeks when just a few years ago we had results on election night. Why is that the case? If, if Trump wins and the, attor- and the attorney general is a Republican, that one of their first jobs should be to find out why these states cannot count votes. That's nonsense. I don't Amen. believe that. I don't believe that they can't count these votes. This is like Mayor Daley used to say in Cook County when, when it was late at night. And the Democrat was losing, and he would say, how many votes do you need? Cook County will deliver them. 
That's exactly what they have to be afraid of. Joe DeGeneva, we'll check in with you one more time before Election Day, one week from today. In the meantime, you know, keep your head about you. And, and no more free advice, okay, because someday we'll have dinner again, and I'm not going to pick up the check. Oh, you're getting a bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. As long as you don't order the wine, that's where we get into trouble. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> it's uh, okay. 760. Let's get straight to Jamie Witten in the Hadid Carpet Cleaning Traffic Center. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. From the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. J.D. Vance squared off with Jake Tapper, and it was a political debate, not an interview. Julie Gunlock, Jake Tapper wanted to confront J.D. Vance on all the mean, icky things that the orange man says oh, at rallies. This was and Cut 17 brings you one of the most cathartic moments that mm. so many of us have been waiting for. J.D. Vance. Yep calls jake tapper out and this is we're going to let it go uninterrupted two minutes let's go cut 17. ask yourself a basic question about network integrity you guys talked about the russia hoax non-stop the fbi was investigating talked, it the fbi talked, was investigating it and we so we so we recovered them and so you took the words of unnamed fbi agents and put them on your network as if they were the gospel truth you did it again and again a viewer of your network would have believed that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin conspired in 2016. No. That was totally and preposterously false. No. Well, that's what you just said is false. We covered an FBI investigation. I don't know why you want to talk about the FBI investigation. You covered it in a way that gave credence to anonymous sources, accusations. You did it yourself. Your network did it, Jake. But again, can we talk about the issues that Americans care most about? I'm talking about about things that Donald Trump has said. Yes. If you have an an issue with whether or not he's talking about the economy enough, that's between you and your running mate. I'm talking about things he has said this week. Every single rally that he does, he talks about how he wants to unleash American energy so we can lo- lower the cost of groceries. He talks about the fact that housing has become unaffordable. He talks about the wide open border, Jake. Kamala Harris and her allies, you know, it's interesting. Kamala Harris and her media allies, and I would put CNN in this category. You guys, they wouldn't. You guys seem I'll to tell, care. I'll tell you that. They wouldn't. Well, they should watch your network more because you guys seem to care more about Donald Trump's past than the future of the American people. We're running this campaign on making of the American dream. I'm specifically affordable. asking about how Donald Trump is going to be president in the future should he win. And then we're being told he's going to pursue economic policies that lower the cost of groceries and make life more affordable again. He talks about it every single day on the campaign trail. And so do I. What you're talking about is is a, an anonymously sourced story or one guy Nothing who anonymously was, or who Zero one guy cent. one guy who is a disgruntled employee I told where you five ten, other ten people, people five ten other people. people pushed back against him and said that what he said was dishonest so why don't we talk about the policy that's affecting american citizens and not what donald trump allegedly said according to one guy who's f-ed off cuz he got fired by donald trump it's so good god it's so good and oh, and you yeah. hear jake tapper's voice rising and and cracking and engaged again in a political debate here right I, and I, vance I, I, put I, him I, on the defensive yeah I, I honestly thought tapper was gonna start crying I mean, he looks yeah. so upset and so just shocked at the pushback that vance gives yeah. him it was brilliant Vance is is masterful at this. Well, and it reached a point here again where Jake Tapper was so emotionally engaged. And of course, remember, remember that Jake Tapper is an unbiased, objective, professional journalist. He's the only one who actually has so much respect for both sides. He's the last great journalist. Just ask him. He'll tell you. But listen to how incredibly emotionally engaged he is here. Mm -hmm. This isn't an interview. This is a debate. Listen Mm -hmm. to Jake. So, so all, all those, those 10, ten people, including the former vice president, uh, Mike Pence, all of these people are have this horribly damaged worldview, and they're all just going after Donald Trump because they want to send people into war? That's what. That's really your argument? Absolutely. It's not like these are Absolutely. conservative. That's my these argument. These are not conservative Jake, Republicans. These, people, these aren't conservative these Republicans people, who are Jake. concerned about Donald Trump. All of they're these, not. That's all not of right. These, all of these people, Jake, they came into office thinking that they could control Donald Trump. That when he said he wanted peace in the Mike world, Pence thought he could he, control Donald yes, Trump. Yes, he did. And when he found out, <laughs> really, that he, when he found out that he couldn't, they all turned on Donald Trump. By, by the way, let me just say something here because uh, I, 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 I really do like Mike Pence, but I think that, at, like many people, he was broken by Trump, and I get it. But mm-hmm. Jake Tapper laughing there, laughing in JD Betts. I know. Really, Mike Pence thought he could control Donald Trump. Let me just tell you something. This is your your buddy Larry in the morning here talking to you. Can I just tell you something? 
yes, Mike Pence absolutely believed that he could control Donald Trump. Every single person in that White House thought, from Steve Bannon to to uh, General Kelly to Reince Priebus to Mike Pence to Jared Kushner, by the way, who who was wrong when he thought that as well. Every single person in the Trump White House thought they could control Donald Trump, and they were all wrong about it. Yes, Jake. And for the fact that eight years later he still doesn't get it tells you what a sloppy journalist he is. It's 723. Making sense of your world. I'm a millennial, and I love your show. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. It's fantastic. Making sense of the news. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. Seven thirty-six here. Very busy Monday morning. There's so much to catch up on, and coming up, it's going to get busier at eight oh five with Hung Cow running for Senate in Virginia. Eight thirty-five, Laura Trump, co-chair of the Republican National Committee. This eight-day mark before Election Day. It's Larry O'Connor with Julie Gunlock on O'Connor and Company. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Did you hear this? Comes down to one last play, and it's going to be getting longer by the second. You're all the way back at the thirty-yard line. Now you can step into it. Here comes the Hail Mary with the game on the line. And the ball is caught! Caught! It's a miracle! It's Noah Brown! Oh, my goodness! This town is going crazy! As well they should go crazy. That's right. A Hail Mary finally goes our way here as your Washington command skins steal one from the Bears in Landover. And the town was going crazy. It was a miracle. And Trevor Maddich, I mean, what what's, what's left to say, not just about this team, but about this quarterback who was, by the way, playing injured. How does he even throw yeah. the ball 70 yards with, so with broken ribs or whatever the hell was going on, Trevor? I don't know. He, uh, the adrenaline must have carried him through. I'm just so glad it did. I couldn't believe the ending. That ending was incredible. The Bears had almost finished breaking the commander's hearts. In the fourth yeah. quarter, Bears trailing, mm-hmm. drove down, scored what looked like the game-winning touchdown with 25 seconds to go. Right? The commanders get the ball after they kick off with 19 seconds to go. And then with two seconds to go, they throw that that Hail Mary. And the thing is, this team, this franchise, for decades, those always went against them. That last Bears touchdown in the final minute was always the dagger in another disappointing loss. But with this quarterback and this coach and this team, it is, it is the expectation is not just that they will win now, the expectation is that they will win in spectacular fashion in a way <laughs> that takes a fire hose to decades of caked mud on the souls of the fans of this franchise. <laughs> Trevor Maddich, uh the defense really kept the offense in this game, shutting out the Bears in the first half. But are there concerns here? The first half looked a lot like the commanders in game two against the Giants where they were moving the ball, but they just couldn't get that touchdown in the run zone. They had three field goals. The score was nine to nothing at halftime. Yeah, that was a problem. As the Bears were driving down for the go-ahead touchdown in the final minute, that was the thing I was thinking was that you've got to be able to finish. You've got to be able to score touchdowns. And so the, the game was not – flawless certainly by this offense because they left they left themselves exposed i mean i don't blame the defense necessarily for you know giving up a couple of touchdown drives late just because they had by and large shut down the bears they had by and large shut down the first pick in the draft caleb williams the bears quarterback and of course Jaden daniels the second pick in the draft so that was quite a matchup but the uh, but yeah th- this is not a flawless team by any stretch but they are six and two they yes. are finding ways to win and they're not beating themselves. I mean, if you get down to just brass tacks and the fundamentals of it, this is a team that usually gets beat twice every week. The other team beats them, and then they make mistakes that beat themselves too just to make sure there's a nail in the coffin. And, you know, they're not doing that now uh, to that degree. 
And so, but there are things that they can get better at because look where the expectations are. What are the expectations, guys? The expectations are make a deep run into the playoff, maybe even get to the Super Bowl, and fingers crossed, I won't even dare say it, I'm knocking on wood as I even suggest it. And those are the expectations. Wow. Trevor, just why not? Why not? Because they only won three games last year. That's why not. But I hear you. I know. That's where we're starting to go. Go ahead, Julie. Trevor, there's, there was this funny moment. Um, the Bears, Tariq Stevenson, he seemed to mock the Commanders fans during this final moment. And yet he was the one that tipped the ball into the air that allowed yeah, Noah Brown karma. to make the catch. What are your thoughts on that? That is That, that kind of made it even better, uh, frankly, to see him be the one that actually tipped the ball. Oh, that's 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 really harsh, Julie. It's really fair, <laughs> and it's exceptionally fun. You know, they yes. say karma's uh, fill in the blank, but in this case, I would just say, since we're on the radio, karma is delicious. <laughs> there you go. Case. Yeah, it sort of yeah. rhymes. And again, to, yeah. to break it down, there was a big storm of players at the one yard line. That ball went sixty five or sixty five yards in the air, dropped down into that storm of players. But one of them was Commanders tight end Zach Ertz, big tight end, one of the best ever to play the game. And so that bear that you're talking about had to jump up. And normally, yep. you're told as a defender, knock it down, knock it right. down. But because Ertz was one of the commanders in there, there was another one too, he had to get up as high as he could to try to keep it away from Ertz. And that's why the ball was tipped up instead of yep. him waiting just to beat and tip it down. And then it just it tumbled in the air on that tip into the end zone into the hands of commander's receiver Noah Brown. So, yeah, that, that guy <laughs> being the bear and yes. for it to have happened right then, it's like Carmo was just circling <laughs> around him like a buzzard. <laughs> Just saying, okay, buddy, but you don't know what I do. Yeah. Trevor Maddich, uh, great talking with you. It's always fun to to have a conversation, especially after a victory like that. Thank you for joining us. Oh, enjoy it. Savor it. Uh, Thanks, guys. Absolutely <laughs> savor it. Absolutely. Listen, this is a, a the, the Redskins franchise, and now the Commanders franchise has been around for, you know, how many decades? And like 80 years now with incredible memories. But yesterday's game, yesterday's oh, finish yeah. is is one of the top five, top five finishes of a football game now. Yeah. Uh, in a season Shocker. that is looking more and more hopeful. By the way, we just heard the Jim Nance call. It was the nationally televised game, by the way, for most of the country. They saw this. That was Jim Nance with Tony Romo. Mm. Um, can I just quickly, you got to hear our guy. You got to hear Bram Weinstein, <laughs> our local you know, voice of the Redskins. You hear him every Friday here on our program. Listen to his call. Four of them at the goal line. They bring three. Daniel's backing up. He's just going to have to let one fly. Goes to the right side. Oh. Steps throw. away from the defenders. Gives himself some time. Now steps up, fires, heads towards the end zone. It is oh! 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 Is this going to be a, us on election night? Exactly. <laughs> Let me just say, we, you know, we get chastised if you and I talk over each other now and again. You know, one one phrase or a sentence. Let me just tell you, that is an amazing moment. That's that's terrible radio, by the way, when everyone's right. screaming over each other. I don't know. I thought it was pretty great. Terrible radio, but absolutely priceless moment. Uh, well done, Bram. Seven forty four. Miss anything? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Get today's breaking news on the Vince Colonnais Show weekdays 3 to 6 right here on WMAL. Michelle Obama came out for Kamala Harris over the weekend and delivered a speech at a rally of sorts, I guess. But boy, the mood was um, somber, to say the least. Mm. It was less a speech as it was a scold, a lecture, actually. And listen to Cut 24 here, because this is an amazingly revealing moment. And I'd love for you to comment on it, since you're a woman. This, this had to do with women uh, and their vote. Listen. We have every right to demand that our, the men in our lives do better by us. We have to use our voices to make these choices clear to the men that we love. Our lives are worth more than their anger and disappointment. <laughs> and we are more than just baby-making vessels. <laughs> and if you are a woman who lives 
in a household of men that don't listen to you or value your opinion. Just remember that your vote is a private matter. <laughs> well, all right. Like, go, go ahead and uh, pick that up, Julie Gunlock, my uh, yeah, independent women's forum it is, per- person. Here. <laughs> person. It is just astonishing uh, that they're losing the male vote. I mean, it's just a total <laughs> mystery why they're losing the male vote. This is how leftist women in this country feel about men. They're toxic. They think of you as just a baby-making vessel, uh, yep. that they don't respect your opinion. And you know what? When, it, when you look at Dem- Doug Emhoff, it's probably true for men That's on the left. That's how he treated the women in his yeah. life. Yeah. I mean, it's probably true for men on the left. Julie, it's also a commentary on what they think of women because they think the women who are voting for Trump are only doing it because they're browbeaten, abused, and dominated by the men in their life. You know, don't worry. You can go in there and you can keep it secret so the men don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I love taking I love taking uh, marital advice from the left, you know, people like, you know, Doug (laughs) and Kamala and and I'm sorry, Michelle and and. uh, and Brock, uh, <laughs> and Brock, after reading Brock's private diaries, um, I don't really care what these people have to say. And this is exactly why we are in the situation that we are in, yeah. which is men are repulsed by the message of the left and by women like Michelle Obama, who consistently is disappointed in all of us. Right. In fact, that message specifically dividing women from their husbands or the men yeah. in their lives, it's so divisive. They are mean-spirited. They are sanctimonious. Yes. They are busy bodies. They were, mind your own business. Also, by the way, um, she left... Uh, this is, by the way, at a time when Barack Obama was musing, how did we get so divided in this country, right? And oh, you're, yeah. you're, there's yeah. his wife doing that. Um, but it wasn't just about women and men. It was it was all Americans. Michelle Obama is very disappointed in all of us. Listen all to Americans, this. Cut, yes. cut, uh, cut 25. I got to ask myself, well, why on earth is this race even close? <laughs> I, I lay awake at night wondering what in the world is going on. And it's clear to me that the question isn't whether Kamala is ready for this moment, because by every measure, she has demonstrated that she's ready. The real, con- the real question is, as a country, are we ready for this moment? There you go. See, there's no doubt that she's ready for this moment. The question is, is our country ready? And clearly we aren't. Hey, America, stop disappointing Michelle Obama. You know, step up for once. How dare you? I hate it when mom gets disappointed. It's 7.53. I, I don't understand how we got so toxic and just so divided and so bitter.